A Consumer's Report by the British-based Australian poet Peter Porter appeared in his 1970 collection The Last of England. Porter emigrated to England in 1951 and lived in London. He had various jobs, including being a clerk and working in a bookshop, and later, during the 1960s, as an advertising copywriter. The post-war period had not only seen the coming of television into our homes, but was also a time of prosperity, where higher disposable incomes meant that ordinary people were able to spend large amounts of money on consumer goods, such as appliances, cars, furniture and clothing, which could be mass-produced in ever more technologically advanced factories. These factors led to a boom in the advertising industry as companies, bombarding consumers with the idea that material goods buy happiness, vied for their own share of the profits by transmitting directly into people's homes their image of a life made ideal by the purchase of their products rather than that of their competitors. Porter's background in advertising is clearly an influence on this poem, which explores the way in which consumerism and materialism, and the language that we use to speak about them, have become all-pervasive in our society, to the extent that life can be considered a mere commodity, where the responsibility, and therefore the blame, for how satisfying our lives are, are ultimately shifted away from ourselves. I.e., if I'm not satisfied with my life, it's because it has been missold to me, not because I have failed to make the most of, and to appreciate, what a gift it really is. Even though the poem was written over 50 years ago, the themes it explores are just as relevant today and maybe even more so, as we live in a world dominated by the internet and social media, which give a platform to continually upgradable technology and disposable fast fashion, and where we are able to purchase products, have them delivered to our door the next day, and review them all at the click of a button, before moving on to the next acquisition. The consumer has never been in such a position of power, as the number of stars we award can make or break the fortunes of a product's manufacturer. A Consumer's Report is a dramatic monologue which is a poem in the form of a speech by an imagined person who inadvertently reveals aspects of their own character while describing a particular situation. In the poem, Porter creates a somewhat tongue-in-cheek parody of a response to a marketing survey in which his speaker, immersed in the culture and language of consumerism, launches into a lengthy and cynical diatribe against the unsolicited product he has been sent, which is life. Most of the report is negative, as he explains that it has left him somewhat numb and disappointed at its awkwardness, lack of user-friendliness, meaninglessness, and absence of uniformity. When pushed, however, he reveals himself to be more ambivalent about it, as he concludes that, even though he would grudgingly still buy it, he will put off a judgment on whether or not it is a best buy until after he's been sent the competitive product you said you'd send, which we can only assume is death or the afterlife. The poem comprises two stanzas, the first of three lines and the second of 48, which makes up the main body of the work. It's written in free verse, which means that it has neither a base metre, i.e. a fixed rhythmical structure, nor a fixed rhyme scheme. Line lengths vary between six and thirteen syllables. Enjambment and caesura feature extensively, as the rhythm tends to follow the natural cadences of spoken English. Porter's diction is plain and simple, and he writes in an informal register, all of which gives a false impression of the poem's actual complexity. 
Porter uses a consumer's report to create a metaphysical conceit, which he cleverly exploits not only to ponder some of the philosophical issues that commonly and justifiably preoccupy humanity, such as the meaning and purpose of life, but also to give a sharply observed commentary on our dangerous obsession with the acquisition of material things as a substitute for a more spiritual kind of contentment. A metaphysical conceit is a type of highly elaborate extended metaphor in which an unlikely comparison is made between two objects. In the case of this poem, life, which we usually see as being the antithesis of something that can be described in material terms, i.e. it can't be bought and sold, it doesn't have a manufacturer, and it can't be substituted for an alternative, is talked about as though it is a product, which can. The depth of the poem's cleverness is only realised when we appreciate that the conceit is deliberately, paradoxically, totally appropriate, and yet totally inappropriate, in that talking of life's shortcomings as though it is a product of underwhelming and meaningless mediocrity strikes a chord in the reader and is amusing in the witty parallels that Porter is able to draw. Yet it is fundamentally unable, in its characterization of people as passive consumers, to encompass the way in which our striving to find or make our own meaning in life at a more spiritual or non-materialistic level is what makes it so precious. The underlying message seems to be that we, in the shape of Porter's speaker, have been conditioned to covet and buy material things with the unrealistic expectation that these, with no further input from ourselves, will provide our life with meaning and contentment. And that if we do not undergo some kind of paradigm shift and learn to talk about our experiences using a very different kind of language, with a very different set of expectations, we run the risk of living the only life we have in a state of perpetual dissatisfaction. A consumer is a person who purchases goods and services for personal use, and so knowledge of this definition, when reading the title, A Consumer's Report, gives the reader an expectation that the speaker is about to give a review of some kind of a product. Because the poet is yet to establish his metaphysical conceit, he is able to deliberately set the reader up to be taken by surprise at the poem's actual content. The title is, therefore, very clear about what the poem is going to be about, whilst simultaneously being extremely misleading. Porter begins, The name of the product I tested is life. I have completed the form you sent me and understand that my answers are confidential. He uses this first three-line stanza to put the poem into its context and to establish its conceit, i.e. that life is a product which is going to be reviewed. We learn that he has been sent a form that he has duly completed, suggesting that his responses will be guided by questions which will remain implied i.e. how did you hear about this product, how did you feel when using this product, etc. The second person pronoun you, to whom the speaker is addressing these comments, and your man, later on in the poem, remain unspecified, but perhaps suggest, in the former case, life's manufacturer, i.e. God PLC, and in the latter, some nameless faceless marketing executive employed by him to obtain customer feedback. We also learn that the speaker's answers are to be confidential, which suggests that he is allowing himself to be brutally honest. The second stanza begins the report proper. The speaker explains that he had it, i.e. life, as a gift. In other words, it was given to him free and unsolicited. This is, of course, a truism, as none of us is able to ask to be born before we exist. 
He's not impressed, however, as he reveals that he didn't feel much while using it. In fact, I think I'd have liked to be more excited. The whole experience of life appears to have left him somewhat cold and evokes the way in which it can be rather humdrum, boring and disappointing if we don't work at it. In the next two lines, the speaker, using language that perhaps we would find more appropriate in the context of a review for washing up liquid, ponders the physical body within which life comes packaged. Although our flesh is soft to the touch, it seemed gentle on the hands, he complains that, in perhaps an allusion to our need to use the toilet, it left an embarrassing deposit behind. In a rather long sentence which stretches from lines 9 to 16, he argues that life is not good value for money. It was not economical and I have used much more than I thought. This is perhaps an allusion to the way in which life seems to pass by much more quickly than we think it will and that we get old before we realise. His further thought, an aside which he indicates through the use of parentheses, I suppose I have about half left but it's difficult to tell, reveals the uncertainty with which we all have to come to terms of not knowing how long our lifespan will be. In the final part of this sentence, the speaker seems to explore the effect that religion and philosophy have on the way we choose to use our product, or lead our lives, as he continues, Although the instructions are fairly large, there are so many of them, I don't know which to follow, especially as they seem to contradict each other. Life, he says, is confusing because there are multiple religions and ways of understanding our existence, with just as many ways of telling us how we should live it, which contradict each other. How do we know that we're doing it right? And what if we waste it by following the wrong instructions? He continues by asserting that I'm not sure such a thing should be put in the way of children. In other words, it is as reckless to give a child life as it would be a car, say, or alcohol. Life, he seems to be saying, is too confusing for the young to navigate, for them to make sound decisions which may perhaps have implications for their later life. And he goes as far as to give his opinion that it's difficult to think of a purpose for it. In other words, what do we actually have life for? Indeed, he even remarks that one of my friends says it's just to keep its maker in a job. This rather cynical comment is a nod towards the idea of God as the maker or manufacturer of life, who needs to create it for his own self-interest so that he can continue to be worshipped. Also, he continues, the price is much too high. What he means by this, we can only guess. Perhaps he is alluding to the fact that the necessary counterpart to life, i.e. death, and the fact that we live with the knowledge of this certain loss, not only of our own lives, but of those we love and for whom we will grieve, is much too high a sacrifice. He continues, Things are piling up so fast, after all. The world got by for a thousand million years without this. Do we need it now? What these things are that are piling up so fast is not clear. Does he mean people, in that he believes there are just too many of us for the world to support? Whatever his meaning is exactly, he suggests, using a somewhat nihilistic rhetorical question, that the planet was doing just fine for the thousand million years before life began, and that we are, indeed, superfluous to requirements. We don't add anything of value, so it would surely just be better if we weren't here at all. In another aside, which is demarcated once more by parentheses, Porter develops his speaker into a more three-dimensional character who reveals more about himself than he perhaps intends. Incidentally, please ask your man to stop calling me the respondent. I don't like the sound of it. Which creates an image of a person who is quite petulant, intolerant and demanding. 
This is developed further, as in the next few lines it seems that he has been asked to give his opinions on the design of the human body, which is, he asserts, neither consistently produced nor user-friendly. There seems to be a lot of different labels. Sizes and colours should be uniform. The shape is awkward, is waterproof, but not heat-resistant. The way in which the speaker seems to condemn diversity in any shape or form gives an indication of the extent to which he has become dehumanised by the artificial perfection which we have come to expect of mass-produced goods. Ultimately, of course, we are a perishable good, in that our body doesn't keep, i.e. we all will die. Yet it's very difficult to get rid of. Whenever they make it cheaper, they tend to put less in. If you say you don't want it, then it's delivered anyway. In other words, ending our lives when we choose to is very hard. The more cheaply it's regarded, the less fulfilling it becomes, and if we try to reject it, we get even more of it, presumably because our attempt has failed and we live to see yet another day. Porter, of course, would have had personal experience of this as he had made two unsuccessful attempts to end his own life during the 1950s. He does, however, concede that it's a popular product. The fact that it's got into the language and the saying that people are on the side of it is proof of that. He, however, personally thinks that it's overdone or overrated a small or trivial thing that people are ready to behave badly or stupidly about, and that we should just take it for granted. The labels we attach to its experts, or those who perhaps study it to try to make sense of it, such as philosophers or market researchers or historians, are irrelevant to him. It's interesting to note the way in which the speaker, through use of the polysyndetic or, seems to equate market researchers with philosophers and historians, suggesting the cheapening in the eyes of the modern consumer of academic disciplines that have sought to document and understand human existence and behaviour. The extent to which Porter feels that consumerism has taken over our souls is clear, as the speaker contends, in a somewhat anarchic manner, that we are the consumers and the last lawmakers i.e. that the laws and moral commandments of a more spiritual way of existing are under threat as capitalism increasingly shapes the fabric of our lives. He concludes his review with a grudging acceptance that I'd buy it, in spite of his catalogue of complaints, although he remains unwilling to judge it as a best buy until I get the competitive product you said you'd send which we can only assume to be death or the afterlife. The poem implies, therefore, that it has become a normal part of human nature to always desire life to be somewhat different or better than it already is. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.